Good evening, good evening, good evening. It's live, it's uh, eight o'clock, and it is Shelf Analysis episode 39. How are you? Uh, this is Ricochet, you knew that because you're here already. I don't have to explain these things on Shelf Analysis, which is quite lovely, actually. Um, sadly, as you can see, for the first time, probably uh, since well before the summer, I've had to turn the lights on, which is depressing because I look much better in broad daylight as opposed to you know putting harsh light on me where I look slightly jaundiced uh, tonight. I'm not jaundiced, I'm well. All is good. Um, thanks everybody for switching on tonight. It is going to be a fine, fine episode uh, of the series. If it's your first time watching live, either on the YouTube channel or watching in the Ricochet Book Club, how are you? Hope all is well this evening. Uh, there are 38 other episodes of the series uh, you can look back, including last week's one with Donald Ryan, which was fantastic, and earlier episodes uh, running all the way back to March, I think. Um, you can find all of those on the YouTube channel. Just look up Shelf Analysis there. Of course, if you're watching this on RTE Culture, you missed it live, but how are you? Anyway, I hope all is well. Uh, now, a couple of things to talk to you about before uh, I get to the bones of uh, this evening's show. Uh, if you will pardon the expression, uh, worth mentioning. I'm going to go back here and do this first because it was only announced about an hour ago. Uh, huge congratulations to Maggie O'Farrell for winning the Women's Prize for Fiction in the UK for the fantastic Hamnet. Uh, that was only announced uh, this evening. I was feel slightly terrible for people who have won what is such an enormous, prestigious prize at a time like this when you can't have a ceremony and you can't have the hoopla, and you can't have what that means about having all of those people around you. As somebody who's you know, both been to the uh, Irish Book Awards many times and witnessed the hoopla of something like that from having been a judge at the Costa Awards, um, it, it you know th that must have been a, a quite a quiet afternoon. I'm sure she's thrilled. It's a very nice prize, and it's very prestigious as well. And you can see Maggie talk about Hamlet in an earlier episode of Shelf Analysis. She was on with us a couple of months ago, and you'll be able to find more details of that there. Now, uh, also, this was announced last Thursday. It was just after last week's show, and that's why I didn't get a chance to talk about it last week. But the shortlist is up for the International Dublin Literary Award. Chances are you know about it. Uh, if you don't, it is one of the richest literary prizes in the world, and it happens here in good old-fashioned Dublin. Um, shortlist this year is super. I will be honest with you and suggest there are a bunch of them in there. I haven't read as of yet, and I really want to. Um, Liz speaks enormously highly of Pat Barker's Sons of the Girls. Of course, Milkman is there, winner of the Booker. Um, Drive Your Plough with the Bones of the Dead, downstairs, very close to the top of the TBR pile. Uh, there are 10 books there. There will be a winner announced in a few weeks' time. And uh, again, no physical award ceremony happening because that's not how we do things these days. But I was the host of last year's award ceremony, and I'm glad to tell you I will be the host of this year's award ceremony but it will be in a different form and i'm sure they'll be announcing more details about that uh, in the next couple of weeks or so I mentioned this uh, last week but briefly the entire program is up now for the dublin book festival 2020 uh, the dublin book festival happening again in a virtual form this year but in a kind of virtual semi live form i say this because i'm presenting two of the events this year uh, we recorded one of them earlier this week and one of them is happening tomorrow and it does involve being in a real room with real human beings. So I did my first face-to-face -face in a real room interview with someone since March this week. Admittedly, no people in the room. It was just us. It was a strange one, um, but it was uh, it, it was unusual and yet lovely to get back in the room again and uh, to be interviewing people as well. You'll find details about the two that I'm doing and all of the other events happening as part of this year's Dublin Book Festival. Uh, just Google them and look at the website. You'll find all the details there too. We also announced, let me get both of these up here, the two books of the month for September in the Ricochet Book Club. Uh, I announced that at the tail end of uh, the week as well. They are Sarah Crossan's Here is the Beehive and The Truth Must Dazzle Gradually by Helen Cullen. Two exceptional books by Irish authors, both for, for both of them not their first books. However, it is Sarah's first book for adults. Sarah, you will know, is normally a YA fiction writer. Uh, she's been the Laureate Nanogue very recently. Uh, this is her first book for adults, also written in the same blank verse. You'll find all of Sarah's novels in its exquisite I hope you enjoy it. Helen's second book, if you liked The Lost Letters of William Wolfe, this is this is head and shoulders above a book that we originally liked already first time around. And I did, I enjoyed her first novel very much, but this is in a completely different uh, league. Helen's uh, book, Truth Must Dazzle Gradually, and Sarah Crossan's Here's the Beehive are our two books of the month in the Ricochet Book Club. If you want to read along, all you've got to do is look us up on Facebook, uh, find the details there. It's simple, stick in the Ricochet Book Club uh, and you will find it there. One more thing to do. I think there's one more thing. Hang on, there's definitely a piece of business that's hanging over my head somewhere. I don't think so. That could be it. 
which would be nice and a good way to finish off for the evening before we get to talk to our guest. Um, our guest this evening is a gentleman whom I was supposed to do an event with. Uh, maybe he'll have better knowledge of this than I will, but it was a couple of years back uh, at the Ennis uh, Book Festival. And it was that year there was the terrible storm and so many things got uh, shut down. There was snow. And as a result of which, neither of us could get to Ennis to do the event that we were supposed to do uh, about uh, his book that was out at the time. I am thrilled and it is an absolute pleasure to finally get to talk to him, even if it is in this form. Hello, John Connolly. How are you? Hello, Rick. Lovely to be with you. Thank you for having me. I was only mildly offended initially looking at, do you mean there were 38 other people ahead of me on the list, you know? <laughs> I was tempted to look up the list of authors and go, him? Really? Him before me? Anyway, I forgive you. No, this is my grand concern about yourself and many other authors that you're going to go, why, why wasn't I in the first track to people? I'll be honest with you, there's one person I thought of yesterday that I kind of went, oh my God, why have I not thought to ask this particular person? And he has, has a sense of humor like you and be similarly offended in exactly the same fashion. Okay, well, thank God you didn't get in because I would have been 40 there. At least I'm it, it, still it, more or less <laughs> in, in the first, you know, the first four sections, I like to think. It, it, it is also uh, handy that this happens in and around your new book coming out as well. But hang on, before we do that, and uh, for those people who are watching this for the first time, the, the general idea of this is that we like to get authors on and have them recommend their, oh, well, if we're doing that, let's do that first of all. Cheers, chin chin. Um, God forbid I do this without wine. That would be shit. Uh, Where's the fun in that, mm. frankly? It's gone 8 o'clock in the evening. Let's be Ooh, reasonable, right. even though it is live broadcast. Um, and normally we have authors uh, talk about some of their favorite books that they think people should read, whether it's brand new books or whether it's older books. I am going to ask you to talk about the brand new book that's uh, out of the moment, the new Cherry Parker book. But before we do that, I'm going to stick the graphic up. And I'll tell you why. I, I hate unfinished business. and I'm uncomfortable with it. And what I would like you to do, if at all possible, because the event we were going to do was for your Stan Laurel book, mm. He. It was a book that I raved about at the time. It was a book that I adored. It was a book that I pressed into the hands of very, very many people. And maybe briefly, I know it's a couple of years ago now at this stage, but maybe you'd tell us a little bit about the Stan Laurel book and about where it came from. Well, um, like we're of a similar vintage, although obviously you're a much younger man, but <laughs> um, but I, I had grown up with Laurel Hardy and I had loved them, uh, but I didn't know a great deal about them. Um, and then I was staying with a friend of mine in a bookseller friend in uh, Los Angeles, in actually in Malibu, when, when my first book came out. He didn't have a fancy Malibu house. He actually had a, a house that where just at the end of his lawn, it was all blackened where the fire had stopped. So he was that end of Malibu. Okay. Um, and I said to you, know, he was an early internet adopter. Um, and so his house was just filled with junk or what he was calling antiques, but really, frankly, junk. Um, and I said to him, is there anything that you wouldn't sell? Are you sentimental? And he said, no, he said, it's very dangerous. If you're, a, if you're selling stuff and you become sentimental, you become a hoarder, essentially. Mm -hmm. But the only thing he regretted losing was a Derby hat, bowler hat that Stan Laurel had given to him. Oh, wow. And I remember thinking, yeah, I had that. And then I remember thinking, wait a minute, you couldn't have met Stan Laurel because to me, Stan Laurel and Oliver Hardy existed in a kind of black and white universe. If you met them on the street, they would have been in black and white. Um, but of course, he had finished. Uh, Stan Laurel had ended his days in that part of the world, living in a little apartment with his name in the telephone book. And you could call him and oh. say, uh, you know, I, I love your work and I'm a big fan. And would it be OK if I pop by? And he would give you a time and you would drop by. And if he liked you a lot, often if you were a kid, he would give you a cheap bowler hat as a souvenir. It was quite lovely. Fantastic. But I wondered what he had been doing for all that time, uh, because their, their career effectively ends. I mean, they keep working into the 1940s with, with diminishing returns on screen, and they're still performing into the early 50s on stage. But really, their film career productively comes to an end in 1939 with a chump at Oxford. That's the last really solid Lauren Hardy film. And essentially what he'd been doing was living in, a, in, a, in an apartment with his fifth wife. Um, that's another story entirely. <laughs> And, and writing routines that would never be performed because as soon as Oliver Hardy died, he didn't want to be seen in public. He didn't want to work anymore. Um, he was hugely conscious of the loss of this man who had been part of his life for longer than any of the women in it. Um, and so it became a means of, of entering his life. I, there are a lot of books about their professional life. There is very little about their emotional lives because Oliver Hardy, he died before they were rediscovered and was a very private man. And Stan Laurel, although he'd given a lot of interviews and was a prodigious correspondent, didn't really speak very much about his private life. Um, and the more I delved into it, the more interesting they became. Uh, you know, they both had long-standing mistresses. Um, they were both married multiple times. 
And yet the, the through path in their lives was their loyalty and friendship towards each other. And, and it became a chance to write about male friendship. And of all the books I've written, it is, when I, when I get correspondence, um, it tends to divide maybe 60, 40 in favor of women because that's just women read more fiction. I think every letter, and they were often handwritten letters that came to me, came from a man about he. And, and they were all of a similar tone, which suggested that actually men saw something of their own friendships with other men in the book. And that's something that we don't often, we tend to write about male friendship either in terms of quite extreme situations like warfare or climbing mountains or whatever it might be, or, or detective sidekicks, yep. um, or in terms of, of, of gay relationships. But we very rarely write about the kind of mundanity of male friendships and also the beauty of them and how much is unspoken in them. Because I think at the risk of alienating a section of everybody listening, I think sometimes women in particular under, underestimate the profundity of male friendships because so much of it is, is done by action and so much of it is unspoken. Um, and yet I realized that there was hardly a man who read that book who didn't have a friend that had they maybe known since they were growing up or in school and they had held on to that friendship throughout their lives. And in the manner of things, one or other of them was going to be bereaved. And it, it would, they would be bereaved even in the same way that somebody in a marriage is bereaved, they would never be able to, that relationship would never be, they would never be able to form a new relationship like that. And there would always be a gap in their lives. So it became a way I, of writing about friendship. Sorry, and I, I think we should point question. out, no, 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 I, I think we should point out as well that it is a fiction as well. It's, it's, it's not a, it's not a biography of Stan Laurel. Yeah, everything, everything that happens, everything in the book happened. The only thing you're trying to do is, is, make an assessment of, of emotional states, of the emotional states of the two men. But nothing in it is made up, and actually much of it reads simply like narrative fiction, I think. I'm, I'm hoping your internet is gonna hold up because you're, you're pixelating ever so slightly. I mean, it makes you look about 10 years younger, if that, if that helps in any way, it's, it's, it's gorgeous. Oh, wait, really? I'm sorry, I, could, I, I see, you see, you're pixelating for me. Ah, so, this would be much easier if you really and I were fun. sitting on a stage somewhere and, and having a conversation in front <laughs> well, of people we'll, that's we'll the nature of where we all are right now um okay tell me a little bit about the new charlie parker book because there is a brand new one due out now but it's slightly different tell us a little bit about the dirty south it is uh it's essentially a prequel it takes place before the events of every dead thing a younger more grief stricken parker an angrier parker parker entirely without empathy and compassion who is drawn, who has arrived in a small Arkansas town because he is investigating murders that bear a resemblance to the killings that involved his wife and child. And when he finds out that they don't involve, that, they, that, that in fact he's mistaken, he simply moves on. He has no interest in, in investigating. He has no interest in justice for these people. And he gets trapped in a small town and gradually a dawning awareness of his, of his obligations to other people begins to strike him. And, and it's the the beginning of a process of change that will result in in the character we eventually meet in every damn thing. And I suppose, firstly, why write this story beyond obviously that you have have written so much about this one character that it's it's an area that you you you've never gone into before. Because after seventeen, this is the eighteen novel, and there's a novella as well. Um, the analogy I've used is that you become a little bit like Jacob Marley with his chains, and that you're you have everywhere you go, you bring these this vast history of these the, this man and the characters around him that that you've written. And and as I get older and can't remember where I left my keys, that becomes quite testing. And I, I thought it would be quite liberating in a way to go back to a time when I didn't really have to be quite as conscious of that. But also that if you're a reader who'd never read my books, you could enter at this point. But if you had read all the others. You bring some of that history with you anyway, and you're you're looking for little shards of the person that you've come to know in, in this figure who's much younger and, and vastly different. Um, and it was a challenge, and also it was a way of, I, I, I love, my books have an element of the supernatural to them. Um, and I think you, all writers develop tropes or conventions, things that they know work and that they can fall back on. And so I decided to strip a lot of those things away the, the, a lot of the aspects of the book that people actually liked, I thought, what if I set those aside? Mm -hmm. What if I don't give them the character that they love? What if I don't let them meet the people that they've become so used to? Mm -hmm. Can I still do that and make the book a satisfying experience? As I've often said to my editors, um, every book should be an experiment. Every book should carry with it the risk of failure or else 
you're not learning anything and you're not progressing. So yeah. there's a satisfaction, a creative satisfaction in taking that chance. There is also an inherent danger in that, I would suggest, when you have people that are as, as wedded to a character as they are to Charlie Parker. Yeah, but, but it's not a democracy. <laughs> you know, we, we don't take a vote. And in the same way, I had dinner with uh, a man named Donald Penzler, who is the proprietor of the mystery, mysterious bookstore in, in New York, and is, is kind of the original mystery bookseller. Um, and he said two things to me. He said, you made two mistakes in your career. And this is just quite recently. So he met me when I was young and said, here's, here's some advice for you going down the line. After 20 years, he said, you still have made two mistakes. He said, the first mistake is that you shouldn't have mixed genres. He's quite a purist. He said, you, mm -hmm. you know, the supernatural, the anti-rational has no place in the detective novel, which is a rationalist genre. Mm -hmm. And he said, the other thing that you did wrong was going off and writing other things in between. Because the secret of success is to write, uh, as Lee Child, if you've ever, would tell you, is to put, publish the same book, versions, a version of the same book with the same character at the same time every year. You'll never lose money and you'll mm -hmm. never lose readers because people will forgive a weak book for the pleasure of spending time with those characters. But you will stagnate as a writer. And I'm not good enough, and I, I'm very careful about saying this because I'm not pointing the finger at other genre writers. I'm not good enough to develop as a writer solely within the confines of the mystery genre. I have to step outside to learn something new, to develop a new skill. And thankfully, I have publishers who've been incredibly tolerant and supportive. I mean, admittedly, I, I meet them more than halfway in that I'm simply not going to be paid as much for a Parker, for a, a book like he as I would for a Parker book. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, and in some cases, I've given books without any advance at all. And we've just agreed that I will take royalties on whatever is sold because they understand that creatively it's important for me to do this. And I understand that maybe they're not going to make a fortune out of my great Russian novel. So somewhere in the <laughs> middle, we, we agree to me. That, seemed, that seems uh, only fair. And um, before we get into the books that, that you've chosen, if you do, um, if you're watching this live in the Ricochet Book Club, of course, if you're watching this later on, you can't ask live questions. This happened a long time ago. If you're watching live, you'll be able to ask uh, questions. Uh, just leave a comment below here in the Ricochet Book Club. Emily says, John's my favorite author. My daughters accused me of fangirling when I met him a couple of years ago. Lovely to see him. Uh, oh, Emily's and lovely. And I'll Don Jimmy, up. Don Jimmy says, "Fish the dirty south." A few days ago, John, it's another great work. Uh, Yvonne just says, "Every Charlie Parker book is like having a visit from old friends." I love the ease of falling back into such a familiar world. And Yvonne is is your is your reader, presumably for for, for each of those books or or one Thank of them. Um, tell me, uh, allegedly, we are here tonight for you to show us a few books that you really love and that you think people should have a crack at in one form or another. So, what have you chosen tonight? Where would you like to start? Well, I kind of made a random search of my shelves and, and I pick books that, that for various reasons they're important to me. Um, some of them are not even the best book by the author involved, but but I can make a case for each one, or at least there is some I have a I have a particular affection for that book. One of the first ones I picked was uh, Viva by E. Cummings, uh, which is a book of poetry, and actually I will set alongside it Zypi and Is Five and Tulips and Chimneys <laughs> and all these other ones. Here. Um, I came out of the Irish secondary school system with an absolute hatred for poetry because simply of the way it was taught to me at Sing Street where things were really, I wouldn't say they were virtually beaten into you. There was, you know, you learned the tone of the poem and the theme of the poem and mm -hmm. the mood of the poem. And, and so I came out thinking I never want to read poetry again. And I went to see Woody Allen's Hannah and Her Sisters at the screen, the old screen cinema. Oh, I remember and it well. Yeah, which uh, just a fantastic place. And a place along with places like the Curzon that a lot of us discovered art house films. Mm -hmm. And he used a line of poetry as an intertitle in that film. And it's, it's a line from Cummings, uh, from a poem called Somewhere I Have Never Travelled. And the line is, no one, nobody, not even the rain, has such small hands. And I thought it was the most extraordinary image and the most beautiful line of poetry. And I thought, I really need to find this poem. But this is 19, I think, 85, 84, 85. Mm, yeah. um, and you couldn't just search on the internet. And when I went to the library, they didn't have any Cummings, E.E. E. Cummings poetry. E.E. E. Cummings wasn't that kind of poet. And the only way to find this poem, so, and I also bought two collections of his poetry that they had in Hodges Figures, neither of which had the poem that I was looking for. <laughs> and so I think, well, what do you do? And so I went to Fred Hanna's bookstore on Nassau Street. And you could go down to the basement and they had an old uh, computer screen that had these kind of plastic files with, with all the names of books in print in the US on them. And they searched for them. And I said, look, I'm looking for a poem. Um, 
And I guess the only solution is to keep ordering E.E. E. Cummings books until I find them. So they must have thought they were quids in. And so, <laughs> uh, so these books had to be ordered from the United States, and they would take about a month or so to come. And every so often I would get a, a letter in the post from, from Anna's, which was always a kind of a little card that said, your esteemed order, you know, your esteemed oh. order is now waiting for you. And you had to go down to the basement of Anna's. I don't know if you remember this. There was an old guy there who dressed like an undertaker. Hmm. And he had... Um, he had a kind of black glove on one hand. So he was like an undertaker who'd once killed someone in a gunfight. Um, and so you go to him to collect your book. And, it, and I would go and I would pick up a volume like Zypi or Is5. And they're edited by a guy called Firmage. And Firmage wouldn't even throw you a bone by including the list of first lines in the, in the book. Yeah, mm -hmm. I had to read every poem. Oh. So it took me about four volumes before they eventually sent me Viva, which had the poem that I was looking for in it. But by then, I'd fallen back in love with poetry. And particularly with, with Cummings. And he wrote, he then, um, towards the end of his life, he was asked to give a series of lectures at Harvard. And they're collected in this book, which is six non-lectures, uh, which is signed by him. I'm really very fond of this copy. And um, he was waiting outside to give the lecture. And he heard the kids in the, and it was mainly young people in the audience, reciting one of his most famous poems, which is Buffalo Bill. And he was so moved by them, they were almost singing it that he burst into tears. And, and he, I, Six Known Lectures is, a, is an extraordinary book about for anyone who's interested in writing or interested in the craft of poetry. Because Cummings is incredibly modest. There is a very famous writer of this parish who is notorious in, in Irish literary circles for giving once a year, whenever he strokes she publishes a book, a very, <laughs> a very self aggrandizing interview, completely lacking in any kind of self-awareness or much resembling modesty. Um, and, and so, and reading Cummings, Cummings is invited to give lectures about his, his life and his work. And he spends most of his time talking about other writers. Um, at the end of each lecture, he recited poetry, but most of the poetry wasn't his. You know, he picked people who had influenced him and he recognizes, as a lot of us do, that we are the sum of all our influences. And if we bring it on a fraction, we've done something worthwhile. So uh, those books of poetry, um, and particularly that signed copy of, of non-lectures, non I suspect if there was a fire, I might try and grab non-lectures and possibly Viva, just in case every other book of Cummings burned down. And I'm sorry, a few years back, Ryan Tuberty, um, also a had uh, he was interviewing uh, Al Pacino in Trinity. And Al Pacino recited that poem somewhere I've never traveled, but recited it wrong, which really annoyed me. And then I couldn't quite remember it right. And I kept wanting to go, Al, oh, no, it doesn't go like that. I'll just, I'll I have a copy. I can, I can show you. It's yeah, here. Call me, Al. I'll be there 10 minutes. I don't live far away. Get it right. So, uh, so E. e. Cummings. Um, uh, yeah, any, uh, Viva is the one that has the poem I love in it somewhere I've never traveled, but you can find it on the internet. And it's quite a beautiful love poem. Um, and, and six non lectures for anyone interested in the craft of poetry and the writing. That's, that's a fantastic first first set of suggestions all in in in, in one location. Um, okay, what next? Where, where do you go from there? Um, I'm gonna pick. I, I I can't like somebody who doesn't like P.G. Woodhouse. Sorry, I'll move. That's my a one P.G. Woodhouse book. If, but if I were to turn my screen around, there would be shelves, particularly of these lovely Everyman editions. Um, and I particularly couldn't like somebody who didn't like James and Wooster. Okay. I'm not a Blandings fan. I, there's a there's a slight sourness to Blandings, which the Blandings novels, which I, I don't particularly like. And I also find Lord Emsworth, the guy at the centre, kind of unsympathetic and a bit boring because he only cares about his pet pig. And the butler isn't very interesting either. But Jeeves and Wooster are a classic double act. And whenever I feel down, I'll pick up, take a Jeeves and Wooster book from the shelf and reread it. Um, as he got, I'm, I'm rereading what I'm reading, rereading one of the early ones at the moment, and it took. Woodhouse a while to work his way into the characters. But by the time you get into classic Jeeves and Wooster, so I'm talking really about the books that were written in the 30s into the 40s, every line is exquisite. And it feels like you, you slow off your cares and you enter a world that is completely detached from it. It's got nothing to do with reality. You know, all you have to worry about is women who want to marry you who are essentially unsuitable and aunts who want something from you. But he also wrote, uh, the book I was waving was a book called Over 70. And it's a kind of memoir, but it's a memoir written by the character of P.G. Woodhouse. And it has one of my favorite lines in literature, okay, just which I just think is, it says everything about it. I just think this is wonderful. So he's talking about Shakespeare, okay? Um, and what he says is, Shakespeare's stuff is different from mine. 
but that is not necessarily to say that it is inferior. Now, I think if I had written that line, I would have, have stopped writing for a week. I would have just gone on a bender because that's a perfect piece of wit, you know. Yep. So, uh, so uh, like I said, anybody who doesn't like Woodhouse, they're not coming to my wedding. They can't come into my house. I don't like them. I, I dare uh, the interview may finish here. If one was to admit that one had never read a Jeeves and Worcester novel <laughs> and one wanted a starting point, what would you recommend? Oh, that's a very, I, I would think something like Joy in the Morning, Joy in the Morning, because it's a novel. Um, I think Joy in the Morning is quite quite a lovely, a lovely book. Joy in the Morning or The Mating Season, Fantastic. I think, are, are lovely Jeeves and Wooster books. I bought a lot of books just from talking to people in this series. Okay, where are we, where are we going next after P.G. Woodhouse? Um, okay, I, I'm going to pick a mystery novel. Um, and a, a particular writer, although this is not his best book, but there's a reason why I'm waving, again, waving this copy of the camera. This is a book called Find a Victim by Ross MacDonald, or then John Ross MacDonald as was. And he's one of two writers who made me want to be a mystery writer and who influenced the way that I think about the genre. Um, I was in Trinity in, in the, the late 80s, early 90s. And Trinity at that point still had a suspicion of really any author who wasn't safely dead uh, and certainly anything to do with genre fiction, but a lovely man named Dean Ross with whom I'm still very good friends, uh, introduced a, a class in, in detective fiction, which I signed up for. Although I didn't know a lot about, about um, mystery fiction at that point, but it seemed a better bet than critical theory or 19th century poetry, quite frankly. Um, and one of the books on it was a book by Ross MacDonald. And MacDonald is one of the four great Californian crime writers, although like most of them, he wasn't actually born in California, but he writes about California. A late contemporary of Raymond Chandler's, but Chandler, it turned out, absolutely hated him. Although uh, MacDonald idolized Chandler. Uh, when Chandler's letters were posthumously published, he did everything he could. He vented his spleen about Ross MacDonald um, and had done a lot to scupper MacDonald's career. And I think in part, it was an element of envy on Chandler's part. There are writers who do not send the elevator down after them. Mm -hmm. You know, they they don't want they they maybe have to fight their way to the top, and god damn it, they're gonna guard their place on the battlements. And I think there was a bit of that in Chandler, and I think he felt critically underappreciated. And MacDonald when he came along, because MacDonald is is I think the first great psychological novelist that the genre produces in America. But also he's a better novelist than Chandler. Chandler has, there are extraordinary moments in Chandler and Chandler's an extraordinary prose writer. He's not a great plotter. The books don't hang very well together. And sometimes his, those little bombs of prose that he puts on each page kind of draw too much attention to themselves and draw attention away from the book. And MacDonald was a much subtler writer than that. And so as with Ross MacDonald, or as with, sorry, with, as with E.E. E. Cummings, I began haunting secondhand bookstores for Ross MacDonald books because they were quite hard to get. He had been published for a while in the UK in the most inappropriate covers. They were very 70s covers with kind of one of them for the moving target has a picture of a woman's breasts with a target shoved between them. Mm -hmm. And this for a man who, as far as I can remember, never has sex in a book. He has the longest dry spell in literature. Um, and so I, and I found quite a lot of them. The one I could not find for Love No Money was, was Find a Victim which is the, the last book he writes is John Ross MacDonald, I think. And my, my family, my mother and uh, father, like a lot of people, they, they, most of the books, my, my father wasn't a reader at all, but my mother read an awful lot, but people didn't buy hardback books. You know, we bought used books or we, we borrowed from the library and you put your name down on the list and the library might have one copy of the book and there were 50 people ahead of you. Mm -hmm. um, but a bit like my grandmother, every, they were very proud of the books that they had because it was important to show that you understood the value of books. So my grandmother had a shelf of books. She had an encyclopedia that was so out of date, they were still probably talking about, you know, man-made flight or some kind of speculative fiction. Um, and I remember just having to go, there were two rows of books and stuff buried behind on the shelves. And lo and behold, on my, the shelves of my parents' house was a copy of Find a Victim by John Ross MacDonald that came from a, 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 a warm rat's, bookshops and lending libraries somewhere in the United States that still has the little binder around them, which is probably, you know, your local grocery store would have lent, loaned you a book. I have no idea how it came to be in my parents' library, but, um, but yeah, the book I wanted was there. And it's something, it was just fate. 
I think there's something wonderful about knowing the provenance of a book like that, knowing that it has come from somewhere that is on the front. There's nothing, no greater joy than going to a secondhand bookstore or finding a book somewhere and realizing there's some little information about its history, where it came from, a hand it passed through. Or, you know, I, I do quite love those ones where it's a store somewhere you've never been and probably one that doesn't even exist anymore. It's yeah, I have I, one of the books I was going to bring up is actually a volume of Byron's poetry. I think it was the first volume of his poetry published after his death. Um, that I bought at a book sale in Trinity College many years ago. And inside it, was an ins there are two inscriptions. Uh, and the first inscription is to um, the family of a man who had died on a battlefield, during clearly during the, the Napoleonic Wars. And this book had been present, given to his family as a memento of this guy. And then wow. the inscription after that is from 1876. And someone else has passed on this book. Yeah. And I'm quite tempted, although I'm not somebody who genuinely writes upon books, I might add my inscription to it and give it perhaps to one of my sons to be part of this continuum because yep. this book has clearly been valued and cherished over more than two centuries now and, it, and I feel like it's, I'm the kind of curator of it for the moment and it will pass on to somebody else after my death and that's maybe as it should be. Yeah and that's the the, the wonder of secondhand book collecting and one of the you know best things that I've done over the space of the last while has been managing to get back into a second-hand bookstore and actually rifle around through, you know, that, that or smell even, of books. even a bookstore. I mean, yeah. this lockdown taught readers the value of a bookstore because an algorithm isn't the same thing. You know, an algorithm is just monitoring your searches and then tossing stuff at you. There's nothing better. I love bookstores where... Um, Somebody on the staff has written a handwritten note about how much they love the book. Yeah. You know, and I, I, I'm guaranteed to gravitate towards those. And we'll always end up buying something that, that I hadn't anticipated because you're always looking for recommendation. And yet none of us really want to go up to a bookseller who can sometimes be slightly, you know, haughty people, you know. Oh, Never. Sometimes go into bookselling. Um, and, and ask them for recommendation. Not also you're afraid that if you ask them for recommendation, you're going to end up with 40 books that you can't afford and you're too embarrassed to say that, you know, you only came in for one and none of them resembled this one. And and yet that's the whole purpose of this program. Um, okay, have you, have you got something else for us? Do you want, do you want to I do? I do. I'm going to pick, because this is my slightly, this is my confession moment. Oh, uh, lovely. So I'm going to pick John le Carre. Mm. Um, and I'm picking le Carre because um, I was a recent, like a lot of, certain musician, Van Morrison, I came to late in life. Le Carre, I came to a little bit late in life. When I was publishing, when I published my first book, Le Carre had just published a book called, oh, sorry, Single and Single. Um, and I met him in a bookstore and he was signing and and I said, God, you know, uh, we, we share a publisher now. And, and I asked him to sign the book to me and he very kindly did. And I was then asked by the Irish Times when I came back to Dublin to review the book. When I was still comfortable with reviewing books. I do it very seldom now. I, I don't like doing it uh, because I don't like writing about a book I haven't enjoyed. And I know how difficult it is to write a book and nobody sets out to write a bad book. And and it's why I dislike seeing people take undue pleasure sometimes. It, certainly reviewers who kick down, who punch down. Mm -hmm. If you're going to be a reviewer, punch up. Don't be punching down to first time writers. So I reviewed single and single and I really didn't enjoy it. I think perhaps Le Carre at the time was quite conscious of the rise of writers like John Grisham. And it reads a little bit like Le Carre attempting to write a John Grisham book. And also, I think he'd been slightly thrown by the fall of the Berlin Wall. And, I, th you know, that milieu that he used to write about was gone from him. Yeah. And I think he was perhaps struggling to find his feet a little bit. And about a year later, the Irish Times said, um, or two years later, he put, Le Carre published The Constant Gardener, and the Irish Times was about to start its colour magazine on Saturdays, and said, would you like to interview John Le Carre in London? And I thought, blimey, I'd written a, a ropey review of, you know, and, and you know, once you've done that, you don't, want to, you don't ever want to see the writer again. God forbid mm -hmm. that you meet the person, let alone go into his house. <laughs> um, but I thought, you know, faint heart. And I went and I liked The Constant Gardener an awful lot. The Constant Gardener is a wonderful book because he rediscovers rage and righteous anger. And so I went in and Le Carre, I think, oh, has always said he doesn't read reviews. But I think um, given that he was, he was quite aware of things that had been written about him. And... He, he didn't say anything about, obviously he wasn't going to say, by the way, about that review. And I, if you want me to, if you want me to be on the screen, I will come back to you about a writer who did say that to me based on a review. Would you want to join? Yes, please. Um, so anyway, Le Carre, and I had a very lovely time with him. And he was incredibly hospitable and very kind and uh, gave me a glass of whiskey at the end of it. And I then 
by then I had begun to immerse myself in Le Carre because when they asked Tommy I was going to interview him, I went back and read an awful lot of his work. And I realized just what an extraordinary novelist he is. Um, and his theme is betrayal, I think. Um, but not, not just the betrayals within the system, the idea that somebody will be a spy and betray their country. If you read a book uh, like Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy, which for me is, is my favorite of his books, um, the betrayal there is as much personal as political in that it's indicated and suggested, I'm not giving any way that, that the, the man who is betraying his country is also possibly the man who is sleeping with Smiley's wife. Mm -hmm. And what Lecari says is not that the guy who, will, who betrays his country is also the guy who will betray his friend, but that the man who will betray his friend is also a man who will betray his country. Um, and over the years, Lecari and I have exchanged letters. We've never met again, but we exchange letters. And a couple of years ago, I, I, I wrote a letter confessing my, my absolute guilt and shame about that review that I'd written a single and single. Because it wasn't that I felt critically I was wrong, but I was a smart ass in the review. Mm -hmm. I was just glib. And he deserved more respect than that. And he sent me the most lovely note back. And he said, you know, he said, it's not the book I would want to be buried with, um, which was a very generous way of doing it. So... Um, so that was my shame, really. I can tell you about the one who, who do you want to talk about the other one? I think he, anything you're comfortable saying in a well, public forum, this is, you knock this yourself. Is, this is, this okay. is, this is, back to this one. Okay. this is, this is, yeah, this is going to go out. I, 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 will I name, I, I won't name the writer just in case. Okay. Um, but I, I didn't, it won't be too harsh. You can probably go looking through the interviews that I did, but I interviewed a writer for the Irish Times and I interviewed, I did it as a kind of swap because I wasn't terribly keen on doing the interview. But the Irish Times agreed to let me interview two people I really wanted to interview. One of them was Laura Littman uh, in return. I think the other might have been George Pelicanos. And so I didn't interview. And the writer cl clearly did not want to talk about anything but the book. Mm -hmm. And yet the writer had lived an incredibly interesting life, but was just reluctant to share any detail of it with me. Um, and at one point, the writer's daughter came in and the writer suggested that I might want to talk to her daughter as well, because... The daughter had written a book or was writing a book. And I thought, this isn't really why I was sent to do this. Mm -hmm. And after, at the end of a very frustrating hour, I kind of said, well, OK, that was fine. And then she began, the writer became very, very, I'm going to give it away anyway, it became very talkative. And I went back and wrote the interview. And I, the interview was reasonably kind. I think it just said, look, you know, it's probably not wise for a publisher to send out a writer who clearly doesn't want to talk very much about anything terribly interesting because the book itself was just, it was another book in a series. Mm -hmm. And there's a limit to what you can talk about, about it in that. Sure. And subsequently, I ended up at a, one of the reasons why I don't really do literary festivals anymore or go to prize giving ceremonies. Um, I was at a literary festival in, in a small town in the United States and this writer was at the festival. And it was so small that at the end of the festival, they took the writers involved out to dinner. And it was there were enough was just to fill a table with the organizers. Ah. And after this writer had got outside of a bottle of wine, the writer leaned across the table to me and said very quietly, you know, I didn't very much care for that interview you wrote about me. And the table went silent as people thought, it's kicking off. Now the entertainment started, you know, <laughs> we've had to sit through the talks about it. Now the show begins. And in the at the end, we agreed to differ. And when I wrote, uh, when I edited with Declan Burke, Books to Die For, which was a book where we invited writers um, to, to write an essay about the book, the mystery novel they would hand to somebody if they were trying to convince them to read mystery fiction. That writer wrote a, a beautiful, a very generous essay. So I think, I think it was enough that the writer managed to get it out of his, her system by leaning over to me. And I clearly had it rankled, but you know, it was just one of those questions of as, a, as an interviewer, you want something. You know, you you just want some shard of humanity that you can kind of put into the book, into the interview that differentiates it. So, and and I don't think after that I did very few interviews. I found that I didn't want to go through that experience again or put a writer through it. I I think I find I get all of that by interviewing people sitting in their own houses. People just <laughs> are remarkably open about about lots of things. Very briefly before we finish, I have a couple of questions um, that have uh, come in and have been asked. Uh, hello to the wonderful Cat Hogan, a fine writer in her own right, who says, is John a corner folder or a bookmark man? I'm a bookmarker. I hate folder. I'll fold the corners of magazines because I'm going to throw the magazine out eventually. But um, but books, no. God, no. And I, I'm one of those people who hates, don't give me a book that has a spine broken on it. 
Ooh. You know, no, that's that's a no no. So no, I'm not although one of the books I was gonna wave at you was was my copy of I love Wuthering Heights. It's one of my favorite novels. But this is my school copy of it. And it's filled with all that, you know, when you underline stuff and yeah. VIP, good point. So you can see the stuff highlighted. Yeah. Um I have but a I still even and actually even having to study it at school did not diminish in any way my love for Wuthering Heights, which is one of those books that I, I press upon people. Um, really quickly as well, Zoe Miller. Hello, Zoe says. Hey, Zoe, uh, how are you? Zoe says, what's your favorite bookstore? Oh, that's dear, like asking I can't, to pick a child. Uh, no, that's terrible. That's 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 a really difficult question because actually, I, I like Zoe, I think I've been very fortunate in, in especially in Dublin, but also in London with, with the stores that have supported me. So uh, I hate to be that. But I suppose if I'm away from home, to, to browse in the Strand bookstore, yeah. you know, to give myself, and whenever I'm, if I'm doing, when I, in the days when you could do publicity away in the United States, I would always find a way to give myself an afternoon in the Strand and, and would just come out with more books than than was probably wise. Uh, but I loved it. It's just a place of, it's a, it's a book lover's dream. And I think the Strand is one of those places that does that curation thing really well and that you do, you find yourself walking in and there are tables everywhere that are themed, tables in which you'll find things that lead on to other things which lead on to, yeah. I yeah, and if you go, if you go upstairs in the, now it used to be, I think it's in the building next door, but you can now access it through an elevator in the center of the store. They have the Strand, uh, they have Strand Rare Books. They have a rare books room, which is filled yeah. with signed copies of books. So, yeah, then you're in, you're in real trouble when you end up there. Yeah, I've been there. Uh, finally, Maraid. Maraid O'Driscoll. Maraid says, John, who's your go-to current writer in terms of whose book do you most look forward to? Oh, Lord. What a very good question. You know what I am looking forward to? And I, can I wave another book at you? Please do. Um, is I, I, have, I have a slight blind spot about science fiction. We all have genres that we're not entirely comfortable with. Um, but this one, Becky, Becky Chambers, who is a, oh. uh, yeah, an, an American, a young American science fiction writer. And she has a new book out next year. And I will be, you know, I, I badger, because thankfully we have the same publisher now, and I badger them for, for Becky Chambers first. Because she has this wonderful science fiction. I, I used to go into schools and do lectures about science fiction because I had I'd written with Jenny, my better half, a, a tr trilogy of novels that were very much aimed at young women because science fiction was tended to be a very male preserve and it had been dogged by, by chauvinism for a very, very long time. Um, and I used to talk to them about, about writers who are filmmakers who are perhaps more inclusive in that way, but it was very hard to find science fiction writers. Ursula Le Guin maybe would be one of the exceptions. Connie Willis, I found Connie, quite recently. Yeah, I've never Connie, read Connie Willis. Yeah, yeah, once you start digging, there are some, but but it is a very male dominated genre. And Becky James goes on and writes these wonderfully tolerant novels, these novels about people exploring the universe uh, with these tolerance for different types of sexuality, for different races. And at a, in the period of time you're in, we're in at the moment where intolerance seems to be on the rise. Science fiction, as I was explaining to people in schools, is, is never about the future. Science fiction is always about the present. Mm -hmm. And Becky Chambers is so conscious of that and is working so carefully with it. And, and I, I, she was one of the writers I went out of my way to interview. I think she's the second last writer I interviewed. And in part, I interviewed her because I had read an ink column to be in about some comments about genre fiction, and he was quite dismissive about it. And I remember thinking, is this what you're dismissive of? This woman who's so passionate about gender and sexuality and inclusivity and tolerance and is using genre fiction as a way to explore it. Is, is this what you dislike? Because I, when he spoke about that, it, he spoke in a way of somebody who just hadn't read enough of it. You know, um, so Becky Chambers, I think Becky Chambers is is an extraordinary writer and, and the world is a better place for having her writing. And I think that that trilogy of books, the one that starts with the one you have there. Um, yeah, the Long Way to a Small from, from from Planet is And I think she's going simple. back to that universe for the next book. Amazing. Lovely. John, this has been a genuine thrill. Thank I've you very much. I've enjoyed it so much, Rick. Thank you this very is, much. That's If you, you and I both come out with, you know, a glass of beverage drink and we both talked about books and enjoyed ourselves for half an hour, then that's that, 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 that's a win. Tell me, um, I know the obvious answer is that I know this is slightly further forward that there's another Charlie Parker book next year but is there something else happening is there what, what else is happening for you um yeah there is a Parker book out next year um I just finished during lockdown I finished the script for uh the book of lost things which is moving very slowly towards being filmed and that was the first time I'd ever written a script um and it turned out to be a lot harder than I had anticipated, to be perfectly honest. But I was lucky to be surrounded by very tolerant and wise people who guided me. Um, 
Yeah, so maybe down the line, it was, it was I like I said to you, it goes back to what I said to you right at the beginning. Everything should be an experiment. Everything should be something that you really haven't tried before. So that was my thing. John Connolly, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Continued success to you, Rick. Thank you very much. Fair play. Thank you, my friend. Cheers. Bye-bye. And that's that for tonight. Yeah, I'm going to finish off with mine. Um, thank you a million for joining us uh, on the program tonight. Next week on Shelf Analysis, uh, same time as usual, 8 o'clock on Wednesday night, I'm going to be talking to Louise O'Neill about her brand new book, and she's going to be recommending things to us as well. I presume from Cork. I'm not sure where she's going to be. She's going to be the other end of a computer. Um, if you fancy watching back all the old episodes, you can have a look. Don't forget on the YouTube channel. Uh, just look up Ricochet Shelf Analysis, and you'll find all of the previous episodes to the series there. Of course, you can see this in the Ricochet Book Club live every Wednesday night at 8 and on the YouTube channel live Wednesday night as well uh, and chances are you may be watching this uh, on RTE Culture. Uh, other than that back on RTE Gold tomorrow morning from 10am and a brand new shelf analysis next uh, Wednesday night from 8 with Louise O'Neill. That's it. I'm out. I'm going to finish up my beverage. Good luck now.